Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And um, we're going to, of course, continue looking at Daniel chapter 11. And we're going to start looking at the line uh, addressing Rome. So we finished off Greece, though. Um, you know, we might come back to some of that again uh, in the future. But for now, we just need to understand these lines. And so by drawing out of Rome, um, it might help us as we look at all of these lines. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Uh, dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for this morning, for all your blessings, and the opportunity to open your word together and to share, and uh, for the presence of your Holy Spirit that is promised when two or three are gathered together. And we just pray, Lord, that uh, all those who watch these videos will receive a blessing, that they receive insight and understanding and strength for the trials that we face. And we are thankful, Lord, for each person who is searching for truth. And we just pray, Lord, that as um, we study these things, that the truths will, will help us in our daily lives and our walk with you. Help us to sort through these things and drawing out this line. And uh, we pray that your Holy Spirit can be here in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning again. Now, um, one of the things that helped us uh, in drawing out the line of Greece was the symbols uh, that are associated with these lines. And, of course, when we deal with Rome, this verse that Rome exalted itself to establish the vision, uh, we're using this verse as part of the line of Greece with Rome rising. Um, and so it's, it's the beginning of the line of Rome. So in each of these lines, with Medo-Persia, they have a time at the end, they have a period of darkness, they have a line. Um, that addresses them. Uh, so we can see that there's some overlap. There isn't a specific place where Greece begins and that's, or Greece ends and that's the end of its line and then Rome starts. We can see that there's an overlap of verses and that's going to be three verses, 14, 15, and 16. And uh, these verses are going to be uh, really dealing with the fifth Syrian war and into basically the Sixth Syrian War. So <clears throat> if we are going to, to draw a line and we're going to address uh, Rome, what would be the period of darkness? What would the line of Rome be about? So remember that these are, are modeling a reform line. And with each reform line, there's a first, second, and third message, with its each with its... Uh, Arrival, formalization, and empowerment, though the third line, we don't normally look at the formalization and empowerment of it. Um, so the third way mark has, you know, a fourth way mark that follows it, uh, where there's going to be uh, those, some of that, especially the empowerment. Um, but they all have a period of darkness. So there's, there's a darkness, and, and generally what we see is the messages uh, relate in a reform line to the darkness. Obviously, if it's a reform line that's dealing with spiritual reform, the darkness is going to be some kind of spiritual darkness. But that's not necessarily the case with a reform line dealing with a nation. There's some aspect of that nation that uh, that is developed in a reform line. Right. So it's not it's not the everlasting gospel per se. When we draw a reform line of Rome, we're just looking at, at how Rome, uh, follows a pattern that is a reform line pattern. So it would still have a period of darkness. Um, so in, in some of these periods of darkness, we're going to have these, um, uh, you know, battles that are going on. And so if we look at Rome, and it starts here in Daniel 11, verse 14. And in those times during the Fifth Syrian War, that's the Soviet-Afghan War, which is 3,341 days, there shall many, and that many 
uh, number has a symbol as well, but Philip V, King of Macedon, and Antiochus III. And we're saying that that parallels Reagan and the Pope, Pope John Paul II in this case. They stand up, uh, and that can mean make war. And in this case, we would look at this as the solidarity movement in Poland against the King of the South. And the King of the South, in this case, is the USSR. And then it says also the robbers of of the robbers of thy people. Now we we have here the sons of the breakers is actually literally what's in the Hebrew. And um, just to look at one of the symbols there, that's really a primary symbol. If you take that phrase, uh, the sons of the breakers, you have H one one two one. That's going to be sons. And then the breakers is 6530. Together, those give us the number 7651. And 7651 is Sheba. That's the number, the Hebrew number for the word that's translated as seven times in Leviticus 26. So this becomes a real key uh, to understanding this. And and we also related that um, uh, to the period of time, the 126 years from 1863 to 1989, that is the 126 shekels of Daniel 5. So we, we associated those when we went through this study before. Um, and um, the sons of the breakers of thy people. Now, we have here Rome equals the papacy. So obviously, by people is not Rome. The sons of the breakers of thy people is Rome, just to clarify there. And Rome typifies the papacy in our time. And, and they shall exalt themselves uh, to establish uh, the vision, right? So there's lots here. They're exalting themselves to support Egypt. The papacy supports the Polish trade union to establish the vision uh, there we have uh, vision is 2377. We already looked at that before. It's the 2300 days and the seven, 70 times seven or the 70 weeks combined in that number. So it's a portmanteau. And, um, and, and so that word kazon refers to this period of time from 723 BC to 1798. It represents the two desolating power, powers. And, um, we have there, it equals 1989 to the Sunday law, so that there is uh, the symbol there of that uh, history uh, refers to our history and to Millerite history. Right. But they shall fall. So this is referring to pagan Rome falling in the future and papal Rome falling in the future. And in our history, those typify the close of probation in the seven last plagues. So that's how we interpreted Daniel chapter 11, verse 14, in relationship to Rome. Any thoughts about this? Because we did a lot of work on it. It it took a lot to get this fleshed out in this way, because we really needed to understand it. Um, and, and one of the keys really was that we have... Uh, this number of the Sheba, the seven times, right? And we have it represented uh, with the Kazone. So so we have all of this evidence that this is pointing to uh, the beginning of this reform line. So the period that, that precedes the time of the end, which is going to be 1989. And, and so the question then, if we have this, what is the period, what is this period of darkness that we see in verse 14, as it relates to the line of Rome. Would this be the the point that Reagan no longer understood who Antichrist was? Because those that fail to understand the meaning of Antichrist would accept the Antichrist. Okay. So... Um, if we relate it to Rome, because you're relating it to our history, but if we relate that to Rome, Rome is is going to be this world empire, but that's not seen yet, right? Correct. Right. 
So the period of darkness would just have to do with the understanding of Rome's future. Now, okay, now when Rome will exalt itself to establish the vision, remember, Rome doesn't do this because it's thinking about the vision, right? This is God who is behind this. So, so they're exalting of themselves. They, they probably have no idea they're going to be this world empire. Okay, go on, Dwight. You were going to say something. Okay. One small correction. I don't believe that Ronald Reagan ever had a dealing with Pope John the Second. Oh, John Paul. Yeah. <laughs> Be a little difficult for him. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay, now, in this situation, would we then be looking at Philip V typifying Reagan and Antiochus III typifying Pope Paul, John Paul II? Yeah, because you have Rome typifies the papacy. And here, Philip V, King of Macedon, in his working with Antiochus III, um, and, and, and the thing that they're trying to do is overthrow the king of the south, right? Okay. Which they do, right? So this is 1989. And, um, so this, so this, um, is this connection of, that we see in this history. So we, one is we have the Soviet Afghan war, which is occurring. But during that Soviet Afghan war, we also have Reagan, and Pope John Paul II working together. So, so this is during the Fifth Syrian War. You're going to have uh, this battle, um, this this attempt to to overthrow the King of the South, which they do. But you also have the Battle of Paneum in this history, right? So that, that's part of this history. I'm not sure. So that's the King of the North defeating the King of the South. So. We, we didn't really put it in here by name at this point. Um, I think, but, um, but basically it's implied there. So, because it's in the history when we looked at it in the end of Greece. Okay. So, so we have a period of darkness that has to do with, with Rome's ultimate, um, domination of the Mediterranean and Europe and, and Persia and, and all this, this area, Egypt, uh, Rome becomes this, this huge world empire. And, um, so the period of darkness is just not recognizing that. So Rome is not exalting themselves to establish the vision, right? They know nothing about the vision. They don't believe that they're going to be a world empire. They're probably just doing things in their own best interest. The idea that they would end up dominating that entire region. I mean, it might have, uh, you know, later on, you know, obviously they started seeing that was happening. But if you're looking at in around, you know, 200 BC, uh, I don't think that you're seeing that happening. There would be lots of different powers that would be contending. And probably you would see, um, you know, that Greece would probably have the most, you know, I mean, from people's perspective, they're, they're this dominant power that Rome is rising. Uh, there's no indication that they're going to be the ones that are going to, to ultimately dominate. There are a lot of other nations around. Um, so, so obviously, uh, we see, um, you know, Antiochus and the king of Macedon. Right. They're going to combine and they're trying to take over a lot of this territory of the king of the south. And and the papacy doesn't want that to happen. Right. I mean, they're more concerned about being overcome by by these other nations than thinking that they're going to overcome all of them. I would think. I mean, I can't read their minds. I mean, that would be their main concern, being overcome themselves. Okay. So, so we would say the period of darkness here that we can, we can look at this during this war 
this Fifth Syrian War, when um, Rome exalts itself. Now, the idea of exalts, um, we we have uh, this number H five uh, five H five nine seven five. So that word, I'm just going to look it up here again to make sure I've got the right word. Yeah. NASA, right? Or NASA, I guess it is pronounced, the accents on the ultimate syllable. Okay. Um, not sure. Where is it NASA? It's hard to tell. Okay. Anyway, um, it means to lift, arise, right? So at this point, they're arising in biblical prophecy. Could we state this is a point of being lifted up? Um, well, no, they're lifting themselves up um, based on the form of the word. So they're not lifted up by anybody. It, it can mean the, the word can mean bear, like to lift something up, but they're lifting themselves up. That's the idea. That's why they exalt themselves. So uh, the form of the word that shows that. Um, yeah, so it's it's what they call the hith pa'al. So that's um, reflexive, right? So it's, it's a form saying that they're lifting up themselves. It's in the masculine plural form. Um, so... Yeah, so it's got like a, a vav with a dot in it, which gives an oo sound at the end. So it's, and it's got a yod at the beginning. So it's yinasiu is how you would pronounce the word in the form that it is. So they're lifting up themselves, which is now that characteristic of lifting up themselves. What does it remind us of? in the context of exalting themselves, where would we see that, let's say, in the New Testament? So in 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself, right? So that would just be to raise oneself over. So the idea here is that Rome is, is not just it's not just poking up its head um, in that way, but it's actually starting to assert some kind of power, right? It's exalting itself, or that they're, they're exalting themselves, to establish the vision. And, and if we think about this, that this is the Sons of the Breakers, which gives us this Hebrew number 7651, which is the seven times, um, how would we relate what the papacy is doing here to the seven times? What, what would be a necessary understanding to, for us to recognize this? We would have to understand what. I know it's kind of a broad question, but there is a specific answer. We would need to understand the two desolating powers, right? The daily, right? Because when Rome exalts itself here, this is pagan Rome. But in Second Thessalonians, who is exalting itself? That's going to you know, take away the daily. That's going to be papalism, right? So we can see that without an understanding of the two desolate powers, I mean, definitely if we don't understand the chazon, the 2520 for northern Israel, if we don't understand this, um, we, we have, would have a hard time interpreting what's actually happening. So them exalting themselves here is typifying Rome exalting itself, Papal Rome exalting itself at other times. Now, Papal Rome, when does it exalt itself in Second Thessalonians chapter 2? When is that exalting of themselves uh, referring to? What historical period? 538 AD, that period of darkness when it has gone on its supremacy. Right, so it's going to be in that period 508 to 538, right? 
because you're going to have first the uh, the daily has to be taken away, right? And then the man of sin will be set up. And then he's going to exalt himself, you know, from 538 onward. But there is that period of time, that 30-year period of time, um, that we have that transition from pagan Rome to papal Rome. Now, we also parallel that um, that history to the history of the Sunday law. There are some symbols there in that history. And and we also then have to understand that what happens there with papal Rome exalting itself in that history, that it also exalts itself in our history. So where would we place that exaltation of the papacy in our history? Do we just wait till the Sunday law? Or is it earlier? Wouldn't it be earlier? Yeah, so it's it's earlier, right? So so the papacy and and Rome, because Rome is is going to first exalt itself before it's actually established in in a sense in as the nation, right? So it's going to exalt itself before the complete fall of Greece. And we, you know, William Miller placed Rome as far as a prophetic where it lies in that line of of all of these pagan nations, it's going to mark it at 158 because of that league uh, with the Jews, that that's where the Rome, Rome is going to come in. Right. So it's not technically when Greece falls, right. Because we have, you know, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome and the transitions between them. Some of them are more gradual than others. Obviously the fall of Babylon, you know, that's a pretty precise time, but actually, you know, Persia takes over Babylon and then and then Greece is going to conquer Persia. Right? And that happens gradually. But we mark Alexander the Great, and partly because he conquers Persia in, you know, in that very rapid way, which would include taking over Babylon. But now we're going to have uh, Rome conquering Greece. And from my understanding, it's not about the city of Babylon here, um, you know, where we're marking Rome conquering Greece. Um, does anybody know when Rome conquers Babylon, takes over the territory of Babylon? Okay. Um, okay, so I'm just looking on the Internet here. They have Babylon came under Roman rule as a result of the second Mesopotamian campaign in uh, 116 AD. Okay. And any other insights into that? I, I would have thought it was sooner, but. I don't think that, that Rome conquering Babylon was one of the the points that we would normally look at because right yeah and that's what i'm trying to say is is we don't look at rome conquering babylon as the start of rome we we look at it in its connection to god's people that's that's when these different nations now so when Medo persia conquers babylon why is that when we mark the start of Medo persia prophetically it's because God's people are in captivity to Babylon and Persia is going to release them from captivity. Right. All right. Okay. So what about Alexander the Great? So we mark Alexander the Great as what, what I, I can't remember, uh, what Miller does, what year he gives. Okay. So I would have to agree with the comment that was made in the chat. Okay, what does it say? Okay, no. Uh, that's not true. So, um, now when we talk about Babylon, the city of Babylon, the city of Babylon still exists. It was taken over by Persia. Um, do we have it destroyed? Well, maybe I'm wrong. Okay, so, so obviously we had it in 539, but as far as its its destruction, 
Okay, it says um, Babylon. Okay, here, let me take a look. So you could be right. I thought it was destroyed much later, but like after, like after um, Rome had existed. But uh, let me see here. So it was still around in 220. Uh, so. So it was the capital of the Archimedes Empire until it fell to Alexander the Great in 331 BC, according to them here. I mean, Cyrus conquered it, but he didn't destroy it. So after the Diadochi Wars, his successors fought Alexander over his empire generally and the city specifically to the point where the residents fled for their safety, or according to one ancient report, were relocated. By the time the Parthian Empire ruled the region, Babylon was a poor version of its former self. The city steadily fell into ruin and eventually a brief revival under the Sassanian Empire never approached its former greatness. Um, so I'm not sure when it finally, you know, stopped existing as a city. And I think mostly it had to do with the with the change of the water courses more than anything. But anyway, um, yeah, definitely Babylon still exists as a city, but not as an empire, right? So when I'm talking about Babylon, I'm talking about the city of Babylon. The point is we're not using the city of Babylon being conquered as where we mark these different nations. We're marking them where they, where they are now um, in contact or influencing God's people as as part of these desolating powers, right? That's where we mark. So, so we don't mark the city of Babylon. It's not really about Babylon, the city. It's about God's people. Correct. I mean, good, good, you will. Yes. What's what's that? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so, so we mark, you know, I believe, uh, 332 BC as that's where Greece comes into play because they're going to be in the area of Israel. They're going to be con conquering the Levant, right? Is that, is that correct? Is that why we mark 332? I would think that to be correct. Right. So, um, so that's, that's why we're going to do that. So, um, so 332, I think I, I can't, I can't read the chart from here. <clears throat> okay. But yeah. So conquered by Alexander the Great. Uh, yeah. So that's going to be, he conquers the Levant in 333, 332. Which is that whole area there on, uh, you know, Syria, Palestine, Israel. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So, um, now we brought that up, uh, in understanding these, this repeat of history. So we have, uh, what happens with Rome exalting itself to establish the vision. It's obviously um, Greece is still there when Rome exalts itself. So it's going to be this transition period. And so placing this in this, this part where the papacy is exalting itself to establish the vision, right? Um, this would be that period of darkness. And then we're going to have the Battle of Paneum. The Battle of Paneum itself will mark November 9th, 1989. Right. So if we look at verse 15, so the king of the north, and, and just a note on this phrase, king of the north, um, when we add up the Hebrew numbers, the phrase king of the north produces 4428 plus 6828, which is 11,256. And that if it's divided by 365.25, you get 30 years with a remainder of 0.8172.
and 8172 represents July 18, 2020. Now, if we add 395, that's the word shall come, the king of the north shall come, um, we can actually get 12,191 days, which could be counted from November 9th, 1989, to March 27th, which is a symbol of the Levites, 2023. So, so we, we can relate it to our history to November 9th is the main point, right? We're, we're attaching it to that date of November 9th. And we also are uh, giving it as a symbol of that 30 years from 1989 to 2019. And also that symbol of July 18, 2020. All are included in that phrase, the king of the north or the king of the north shall come. So, so we can see that this is going to mark 1989. Okay, so we mark this. The Battle of Paneum parallels November 9th, 1989. We came to understand then the Battle of Raffia parallels February 15th, 1798, right? So those two can, can typify both of those events, the King of the South against the King of the North. Now the King of the North in the Battle of Paneum coming against the King of the South. Now he's going to cast up a mount, and this would refer to a siege, which is going to be this economic and military pressure. This is what happens um, in that history. And take the most fenced cities of Judea. So we're going to say that this is relating to the apostate Protestant churches. Now, we already saw this happening in that history uh, prior to November 9th, 1989, where, you know, Protestants were interested in Pope John Paul II. Actually, a lot of people became Catholics because of Pope John Paul II. Um, and then it says the arms of the South um, shall not withstand. So obviously the South is not going to win. They're going to lose the battle of Paneum. And, and then it says neither his chosen people. But this is the choicest people, not referring to God's people. And it doesn't say neither his. That's just somehow added, uh, taking from the word um uh, you know, not, I guess, notwithstanding. Yeah. That'd be like the chief, chiefest. Yeah, the chiefest. Be. This is the, this is the elect, the elite, you know what I mean, right? The, the global elites. So, so when we have this, um, this, um, so they're not going to be able to stand, right? That is, uh, the USSR, and also the global elites. Neither shall be, there be any strength to withstand. So the global elites, um, the globalists, are they really opposed to the Soviet Union, or are they in line with the Soviet Union? Because the Soviet Union was the hope for the communists, for the globalism, right? Because the idea of communism is that, you know, eventually all of these other systems would fall, and communism would remain, right? Capitalism was going to just disappear because it would become weak and communism was going to rule, right? So people like um, Klaus Schwab, I mean, now he's opposed to the so to the to Russia, but he wasn't opposed to the Soviet Union right? because the Soviet Union was in line with his agenda at one time. But once you have the fall of the Soviet Union, now Russia is looked upon unfavorably by the global elites. Right? So, so with the fall of the Soviet Union, it is in a sense the fall of the global elites. But we know that they're going to, like they're not going to stand up, right? Um, and they're not going to have any strength to stand up at that time in 1989, but they will stand up at 9-11, right? So we're going to see that what ends up happening is globalism moves from the Soviet Union to the UN and 9-11 becomes this, this marker for those events, right? So 9-11 is the UN in a sense 
conquering or at least taking over from from the Soviet Union. Right. So there's this transition from globalism in, in the USSR, the king of the south, the king of the south moves to the UN. And it's demonstrated in that period with 9-11, what happens at 9-11 with the Patriot Act. And this progressively happens that the United States gets taken over by globalism, right? Okay, so that's all going to be addressing basically the Battle of Panina. Right. So it's it's addressing that history. Those that verse uh, verse 14 introduces the history, which is the period of darkness. Verse 15 is going to address. Um, November 9th, 1989, and and what happens with the fall of the Soviet Union. Then it says, but he that is pagan Rome. Or in our history, the papacy that cometh against him shall do according to his own will. So we have here December 25th, 1991. So this is really you know, the complete end of the Soviet Union, right? So it starts November 9th, 1989, and then is completed December 25th, 1991. And we connect that to uh, what's going to happen here. So we're saying that when the, the pa- pagan Rome does according to his own will, we're going to mark uh, 191 BC. So that's the Battle of Thermopylae. And that, that's the center of the 62 weeks. That period of uh, 434 years that can be divided into 217, two periods of 217 years. Right? Symbol of July um, 21st, which is midnight. In the center, that's 191. And do I did a study on 191 in the summer in our study um, that we're doing in connection with the book of Judges. So, so we have, and none shall stand before him. He will subjugate Syria, become the next king of the north. That is, we have now in that history, the new world order under George Bush, the first, right? And we have this new world order speech, 9-11-90. And he, pagan Rome under Pompey the Great, representing here the papacy in this case, right, under Pompey, shall stand in the glorious land. And Pompey is going to conquer uh, uh, Jerusalem, right? So the glorious land represents Judea, Palestine. And, of course, this would represent the United States at 9-11 being conquered, Um both by the papacy and by the UN in some ways, but which by his hand, so we have the word hand, 3027, which represents a message to the Levites, that is March 27th, shall be consumed. And then we have this number 3615, um, this word consumed, and we found uh, that it, it had some application, but we're going to look at this at 63 BC, and this is going to give us 11 1919. So that's going to be uh, November 19th, 2019, 10 days after um, November 9th, 2019. And it's interesting because, um, you know, the siege, the symbol of the siege is the 10th day of the 10th month. So the 10 days there might have some significance. But this is, of course, Daniel 11, verse 16. And we can see that if it's uh, Switched around, it can be 1119. It can represent 1119. Okay. Um, And then we looked at the lexical sum of the verse itself. And this was for 47,903 days. And if we go back to uh, the dogma of papal infallibility that happens during the First Vatican Council that's voted upon, on on the 18th of July, 1870. So we have two symbols there for uh, July 18. The 187 and July 18 itself is a symbol of July 18. Um, And then we're going to see that if we count 47,903 days, it brings us to September 11th, 2001. 
So there's all kinds of evidence that we can take verse 16 and connect it to 9-11. It also has some connection to uh, 11-9 as well, because 9-11 and 11-9 are connected. But here in this history, this is going to be about 9-11, right, when we're making this this direct application. So we, we should have no trouble drawing this out on these lines at this point. Now, the 3615, when we looked at that, um, is nine years and 327 days. And when we look at the Gulf War, it ends on February 28th, 1991. And we can count 3,615 days to the inauguration of George Bush II on January 20th, 2001. That's an inclusive count of days. So it's, so since that, the day that the Gulf War ends, February 28th, 1991, it's 3,615th day is the inauguration of George Bush II. And, and the connection between the Gulf War is George Bush II is connected to his dad, George Bush I, right? So, so we can see that there's some really powerful symbols here in in these numbers. There's probably more that we haven't noticed. Okay, so at this point, we, we can see the period of darkness. We can see uh, the time of the end. And then we have uh, 9-11 itself. And, and we can take some of these other dates, such as the New World Order speech and December 25th, 1991, and easily draw these on a line as the formalization and the empowerment. So I'm going to just create this line here. I probably should have got this ready before. Well, okay. So I just made a copy of the one we did with uh, Greece, but we're going to have to change all of this, of course. So, um, you know, we're not going to have the six Syrian wars. Um, we're going to have some spans of time. I'm just going to get rid of all this up here for now. I'll just get this bare line and then fill it out. Okay, so the so the period of darkness here in in this history. So we're first going to look at pagan Rome. So this is going to be under instead of this, you know, um, what was happening before. The, this is going to be the um, the fifth Syrian war. Right. So the Fifth Syrian War, we're, we're going to have the Battle of Panium in this war. So during the Fifth Syrian War, we're going to have this darkness. Now, the darkness itself is has to do with Rome. So what's how would we describe that? What would be the best way to describe that darkness related to Rome? See, this line's not going to change much at the bottom. But if we can start looking at this, we'll, we'll see how, how that line goes along. So how do we describe that darkness? So we know the robbers, the sons of the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision. So, so what is Rome doing? What, what is, what is not seen, known, or understood that the line is going to make clear? How could we describe this? Since we're dealing with Greece, would this not be the time where Greece comes into connection with the children of God? This is dealing with Rome. Okay. It's not Greece, right? So Rome, Rome here is in the fifth Syrian war. Greece has already conquered them in the, you know, with Alexander the Great. Greece, yeah, Greece conquered Syria. But since we're dealing with, we're dealing with Rome, since we're, we're going to look at this, is this going to begin then at the Battle of Thermopylae in 191. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So I think that we would need to put the Battle of, uh, so Rome conquering Greece. Right. Right. Yeah. You, you, you had it. Greece conquering. But anyway, um, at least that's what I understood. Okay. So you're going to have, um, so maybe what we put here is just, 191 BC, the Battle of Thermopylae. 
I don't know how you spell Thermopylae. Okay, so we have the Battle of Thermopylae. What does Thermopylae mean? I read somewhere, hot gates. Yeah, something like that. I know it has to do with hot. So Thermopylae. It's this narrow pass. Um, yeah, hot gates. Thermal piles, I guess, is another way. So it has some hot sulfur springs there. All right. Do we, inter do we interrelate this in any way with the gates to go into the temple? No. I mean, to the Greeks, it was like the gate to Hades. Um, okay. you know, um, so, I mean, that would remind us a little bit of um, dealing with Panium itself, right? So, so there would be a similar symbol with Thermopylae and Panium, right? Right. The gates of hell, which Christ refers to uh, Panium. Understood. Yeah. So, um, so anyways, we, so we have this battle of Thermopylae. So there, there's lots connected with it. Obviously, we end up with the battle of Panium, also re giving us that same sort of symbol. So that is going to parallel the Soviet-Afghan war. Um, so, so Rome is arising. It's exalting itself to establish the vision. No. And again, it's not Rome recognizing that it's doing that. It's, it's exalting itself to establish the vision is from God's perspective, from the biblical perspective. So this is one of the things where we see you know, that God's hand is behind this, right? It's, it's a very subtle little difference. But if you think that Rome's exalting itself to establish the vision, that, that Rome is thinking it's doing that, that's much different than if it's exalting itself, but this is in order to establish the vision in God's providence. That's quite a different idea. Because, see, Greece and, and all these other empires, they want to exalt themselves, you know, to exalt themselves, right? They have no idea about establishing any vision. Now, Greece is not going to stand. It's going to fall. It's not going to be this world empire in which Christ is then going to be crucified because the vision says that we need this fourth kingdom. And so, so that's why this has to happen. That's why we have what's happening in Daniel chapter 11 is showing you these pagan nations and and how we're leading to to Rome under which Christ is then going to be crucified. It's going to be in his time that the 70 weeks are completed. Right. So it, this is so important, a point that it can sometimes escape us because God is not giving us this history of these nations as a curiosity. He's not giving us this history of, of these nations in detail in the way that these nations would see things. He's given us the history of these nations prophetically as symbols of something that's going to happen. And he's doing it to establish all of these prophecies, specifically the 70 weeks and the coming of Christ. That becomes the focus of this. Because remember at the beginning, you know, Daniel has understanding of how does how do they word it here in Daniel chapter ten, right? So Daniel, he says, he knew the thing that is the matter was true, but the time appointed was long, and he understood the matter and had understanding of the Mara. So the matter is. The previous chapter, chapter 9, the thing, the matter, the word, the commandment to go forth and restore and build Jerusalem, right? And he had understanding of the Mara, the 2300 days. So this is what this prophecy is addressing, right? And I think that point has been overlooked by almost everybody. 
right? The question is, why is this prophecy here? Why are these different nations being described? And they're not described necessarily in the way that the historians would describe them, though they're easy to place in history. And if we understand why they're being described, we can go back and look at the 2300 days. We can look at the 70 weeks. And we also have reference to the chazon, right? So we can look at Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, right? Daniel chapter 8, chapter 9. All of these things we looked at in detail, plus the prophecies in the book of Revelation that come from the book of Daniel. They also give us light on understanding Daniel chapter 11. And so my perspective, and I think you would agree, most of you here, that we have missed out on what Daniel chapter 11 is about. That this is really about the 70 weeks and the 2300 days, and, and even more really the, the 70 weeks almost more than anything, because it's about Rome exalts itself to establish the vision because Rome is going to crucify Christ. That That is absolutely necessary in order for this vision to be established. If Christ would have come in the time of Greece, it wouldn't have, you know, if Greece had been the power in the time of Christ, I guess maybe more. Christ, you know, all that history wouldn't have, have happened the way that God wanted it to happen. But, um, no, no, it's not saying it the best way, but, but you, you understand what I mean. So, so we have Rome exalting itself, and now we're going to have a line that's going to show Rome's um, history that's going to relate to uh, its role. Right, because Ro Rome has a role, and that role role is partly uh, the crucifixion of Christ. It's also typifying the papacy. Now, when we're drawing out this line here, too, remember we're doing the line of pagan Rome first, and then we're going to do the line of papal Rome. That is, we're not they're not going to be, at least in my thinking, we're not going to have uh, this line at the top there uh, being. Uh, pa pagan Rome than papal Rome. At least that's not how I've envisioned it. Maybe it could be that way, like where you have Protestants and Millerites or, um, you know, the daily and, um, the abomination of desolation. And maybe, maybe that could be done. Maybe this whole, we could draw an entire line for Rome all the way up to the Sunday law. But m what I'm envisioning here is that we're going to take Pagan Rome, and we're going to pal parallel it with our history. I don't know. Any thoughts on that? Because <clears throat> we haven't drawn out this line yet, but I, I have a feeling that, you know, Pagan Rome is going to take up this whole line. I'm not going to disagree. I think that Pagan Rome will take up the line. The question is how we're going to be able to you know, basically line this back out with what we've been discussing before. And that's well, what I'm working on right now. Yeah, and I, and I don't think we're going to have trouble doing that. So, um, you know, because we're going to have, like, all this history of Rome that we've looked at. I mean, we've paralleled it with our history as well, but just the history of Rome itself. I mean, to me, it should it should come up to all of this history up to the destruction of Jerusalem, at least, Right. I would agree. And, and, and the reason why I say that is because when we go back to Daniel chapter 9, it's going to address, you know, the crucifixion of Christ in the midst of the week and the destruction of, of the city and the temple uh, by, by Rome, right, by Titus. So, so it's going to address all of that history. Here, this is going to be fleshed out in much more detail. So now when we get to Rome, we're going to get to the rise of Rome and then ultimately um, to the demise of Rome to some degree, because we're going to have Rome pagan and then Rome papal. I'm not sure how that transition is going to happen. I mean, it is possible maybe that we, we could have a line that includes in Daniel chapter 11, uh, 
pagan pagan Rome and papal Rome. But I think we'd have to zoom out quite a bit and leave out a lot of detail to do that. And I don't think that that's primarily the way the line should be seen. Okay, Angela asks about the Battle of Thermopylae in 480 BC and another 191. Could that what would that signify for us? And I, I wondered about that. Now the Battle of Thermopylae in in the history that we have um, in Daniel 11, it's not particularly mentioned. But it is in the book of Esther. Um, and then I shouldn't say it's mentioned there. It's it's that battle is the plan for the battle against Greece, the plan that Persia has uh, to overthrow Greece or to conquer Greece is the subject of chapter one behind the scenes. Right. That's why they're having these these meetings now. But when it comes to Thermopylae, um, you know, I, I keep understand, trying to understand what that symbol is, where we would place it on a line. Now, here in this line, uh, the Battle of Thermopylae in 191 BC, we're putting in this this period, which is exactly center of the 62 weeks, right? So, so we have to keep that in mind that it's and that 62 weeks, the center of the 62 weeks, symbolizes the midst of the week, right? If we if we remember. Um, uh, that, you know, the 700 and, or the 217 years on either side of 191 BC that marks the beginning and end of the 62 weeks is, um, uh, I guess it ends up being 31 weeks, right? And, and then the midst of the week, it's in 31A that it's, 31 AD that it's divided. So the idea is that, the 62 weeks gives us the symbol of 31 AD, which is the midst of the week, right? So those 62 weeks are not just, you know, sort of some leftover uh, mathematical anomaly because of the 70 weeks having the seven weeks at the beginning and the 70th week at the end, that they're actually key to understanding when Christ is crucified, that they give us that symbol of 31 AD. They also give us the symbol of midnight. We know that midnight also has a chiasm in Millerite history. July 21st is the center of the period of time between the first day of the first month and the 10th day of the seventh month. So, so these symbols are all intertwined with each other. Um, but the Battle of Thermopylae itself, you know, here we have it as this period of darkness, but that is in connection with the 62 weeks. Right, so we have to, we have to keep that in mind. Yeah, so 289 years, so two times eight times nine is one four four. So that's interesting. Yeah. So so there's lots of little things like that that we we end up finding all these little. They're not primary, you know, or secondary, maybe tertiary or quadrinary. Uh, evidences they're just things little details that are there that show that there's these connections but a primary one here would be that this is the midst of the 62 weeks that we're marking and that this is really an expression of what's going to happen in the midst of the 70th week right so it's going to lead to rome rising to the crucifixion of christ and so it's fitting that we mark 191 bc the battle of thermopylae in connection with Rome exalting itself to establish the vision. Well, the other the other point, looking at, at this again, of course, we have this span right in the center between the league that took place in 317 BC and then the league that was enforced in 65 BC. Because by 65 BC, you have Pompey taking control of all of Syria and the, and the Promised Land. So you're talking about the Roman League of Syria. I'm I'm speaking that by 65 BC, by 65 BC, Pompey had taken control of all of that. Yeah. Okay. But what what's this league in 317? We have uh, a Greek king deciding to divorce his wife in order to marry another wife. 
Okay. Well, I'm not familiar with this. It's one of the things that I, I started to present when we were up there in July. Okay. So, um, Cassander, uh, does that have anything to do with it? I'll, have, I'll go back into my notes and look this I up. I don't remember, I don't remember this. It's some, it's something that stuck out to me because we wound up with 252 years in between these two leagues or alliances. Okay. And the first one was a covenant relationship that was not according to God's order. Okay. Because all I have here, 317 BC, Cassander kills Alexander's son and seizes power in Greece and Macedonia. But I'll go back in my notes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so I don't I don't know what that is. I don't remember. Okay, so if we're going to mark the time of the end, um, I, I don't think we're marking that as the Battle of Thermopylae. I mean, this is this is unless we're going to put it into some other context. Um, so what we had in verse 16 is the time of the end has to be this war of the king of the north against um, against Greece it's, or against uh, Egypt, right? So we normally mark um, – let me see here now. I I will stand corrected as I'm looking at this. Yeah. 317 was when not a Greek, well, technically a Greek king, but the one that was ruling in Egypt, Ptolemy, marries Berenike, lady in waiting to Eurydice, his wife. Okay. So that's a different Berenice. Correct. Okay. Because that's Ptolemy one Soter. Yeah. Macedonian Greek general. It's also a different uh, year than the other ones. So, okay. So the king of the north, Antiochus the third. So this would be the Battle of Paneum that we would mark here. So we, we have basically 200 AD that we're going to mark as the time of the end. Now, we don't have a date for the Battle of Paneum. Like, we don't know exactly when it occurred. We'll just put here Paneum. Definitely Paneum typifies um, that history, typifies... Um, 1798, or, or pardon me, 1989, right? Raphia typifies 1798. Paneum typifies 1989. So we can see that it's typifying this. Okay, so then we have, um, so we have the Battle of Paneum, November 9th, 1989. And then we're going to have... Um, that pagan Rome, that is the papacy, comes against uh, Seleucid Syria. Seleucid Syria, the USA. So pagan Rome, or the papacy in our history, and shall do according to his own will. So where, where we marked that, and you can see December 25th, uh, 1991, that still would, I would say, is the formalization of the message. It is, it's going to be that history. Uh, but what history would it be specifically in Rome? So when does um, Seleucid Syria become the next king of the, or when does Rome become the next king of the, the north? Now, it's not 19, uh, 191 BC. Now we got Paneum, but it's not just Paneum, because Paneum is not a battle of of Rome. That's an internal battle. So when does Rome become the next king of the north. What's the year? 
So I think the, the, the part, well, maybe, I think actually we got this backwards. So I think, because Paneum's after this, so, or or before this. Correct. Yeah, so I, I think actually we put 191 BC here, and I, I think we have to have just the Fifth Syrian War up here. I think that's better. Yeah, okay, there we go. Yeah, I knew there was something wrong. So the Battle of Thermopylae we would put here as the formalization. At least I think that's what it would be. Then we would have an empowerment. Um, so they're, they're ultimately going to conquer. Now this is called the Roman Seleucid War. And, um, okay, I'm just quickly reading through this. Yeah. So you got the Battle of Thermopylae. So the, that's an important, the spring of 191 BC. I don't know if we have an exact date for that. <clears throat> I will look. Okay. But, um, okay. So that makes more sense now. Let's. So we got the Battle of Thermopylae, and then we're going to have all these things in connection with, with Rome. So, I mean, it's, it's not so much of what the historians say as an empowerment. We would have to say, where is this empowerment? Um, you know, and we have some things that happen later uh, that would. So I, what about the day of Eleusis? Would that be an empowerment of Rome? I don't have an answer for that question, but the answer to your first question regarding yeah. the Battle of Thermopylae is the 24th of April of 191. Okay. Which on the biblical calendar is the 29th day of Nisan, 29th day of the first month. Yeah. It's also interesting because that battle of Thermopylae took place on a Sabbath. Yeah. So what if we had the day of Eleusis as the empowerment? It's possible. I just need some further information. Why would we, why would we be looking at it this way? Well, because the power that Rome then has over uh, Greece, that's, that's a symbol that's commonly used. Eleusis, or we say that. Because we know what happens there. We talked about it. He draws the circle in the sand. I mean, is there something else that we could use more as an empowerment? I'm just having to consider what you're, what you're asking. So this is Rome rising to power. Right. Now, we're going to have, you know, in here, we're going to have, um, obviously the siege of Jerusalem. Maybe we would have the league with the Jews. Um, you know, we have to decide like what this line is about and what way mark. So right now I'm just putting things there. Um, you know, where would we put the crucifixion of Christ? Is that part of, because it's going to talk about it there. In, in Daniel chapter 11, right? So that's going to be in verse 22, right? And then we have to decide, you know, how those are going to fit in with our history. The League of the Jews is in there in verse 23, but we have to decide how, how we're going to divide up this line. Where is it going to end in our lines? Where does it end in relationship to, uh, the line of Rome because once we get to the crucifixion of Christ I I don't it's going to uh, address also the diaspora right and all the destruction of Jerusalem and the diaspora right so that's where the line of Rome is going to uh, arise so at least we go to verse 24 for this line there's a bunch of things about this line that we we have to uh, you know, we're going to have the Battle of Actium. You know, how are we going to address that? Um, so there's a lot of things to put on this line. So the Day of Eleusis might not be one of them. Right. It, it's just, I'm just putting it there because it's an event uh, connected with the rise of Rome. But but the question is, you know, what's going to empower it? I mean, it might be some something that's later that we would mark as the empowerment of Rome. Okay. But that's the things that we have to think about. We have to think about 
okay, how are we going to line this up? And we can't just arbitrarily choose things. I mean, we can arbitrarily try things, but there are going to be things that are going to clearly mark uh, these wave marks. Once, once we look at it, once we sort through it, it should be really clear. And, and the symbols, of course, help. So, you know, 168 BC, on this way mark, the empowerment of the first angel, I mean, we know it's, it's a symbol of a week, but would we put that there? Or is there something else that we would need as an empowerment? It might be even, you know, Jerusalem being conquered by Rome. It might be 65 BC or 63 BC, pardon me, Pompey conquering Jerusalem, the siege of Jerusalem in 63. Now, other things that we had, you know, in, in our lines, we had things like the Battle of Actium and the Edict of Milan and so forth that were symbolized in these verses. So when we, when we look at the verse itself, you know, it does according to its own will, right? So we're going to say that's, that's the Battle of Thermopylae is marking that. Um, She'll stand in the glorious land. So the next thing that it says, he shall stand in the glorious land by which his hand shall be consumed. So I think that what we would put here is actually um, siege of Jerusalem by Pompey in 63. So, because that's the next thing mentioned, he stands in the glorious land, and and this makes sense in the context of how we're understanding this line, because Rome is going to exalt itself to establish the vision. In order to do that, it has to conquer Jerusalem, and uh, and, and it has to conquer Jerusalem in order to crucify Christ. And that's the next thing that comes in the verses is dealing with the glorious land. He does according to his own will. That's it conquering Greece. So that, that has to do with its ex- And none shall stand before him. And he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. So that's going to be the siege. And And we have connections with our history, too, that we can then place in there that are already falling into place. So that works. Okay. <clears throat> and then it's going to talk about uh, pagan Rome under Julius Caesar is going to set his face to enter Egypt with the strength of his whole kingdom. And uh, the of uh, the Jews, the upright ones with him, the SDAs, right, in our history, the Jewish forces loyal to Caesar led by Antipater. Um, That's the Protestants and the spiritual formation. Thus shall he do. That is thus uh, God has appointed by his providence that he shall give to Caesar, that is George Bush II, the daughter of women, the world, the UN, the dragon power, corrupting her. Causing her ruin, fall of the world, but she shall not stand, neither be for him. After this, he, Caesar, shall turn his face unto the isles, the Mediterranean basin, multitude peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues, and which is the UN, and shall take many, uh, but a prince, that is Michael, your prince, um, which represents the 144,000, shall cause the reproach, um, to cease. Right. So here we have the cross uh, mentioned in this history. Without his own reproach, he shall um, cause to turn upon himself, even though he doesn't have his own reproach. So, so we're going to stop there, I think. Anybody have any comments? So, so you can see where we're going. It's, it's all going to fall into place really nicely. Um, and these different kings. What's that? Seems like a good start. Yeah. Yeah. And and we've already kind of worked it out. We just haven't drawn it on a line. But it's going to fall on the line really nicely. 
And then, you know, and then we have an application also, a present truth application, which is going to change this line a little bit. Uh, because it's, it's, we have to address what is the period of darkness in this particular line? Why is Rome, you know, paralleling whatever this history is? It's not going to be exactly the same as the line below, but it's going to be similar. Okay. Well, if there's no more comments, we can close with prayer. But dear Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness and love and for the study here uh, this morning and for your presence and your peace that you give us. We ask for you to be with us throughout this day, to be with those that we love and care for. May your angels watch over them. And uh, we pray for one another. Um, bring us together again to study these things according to thy will. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.